anymore. I think so. Yeah. Good evening and good evening. <laughs> good evening and welcome to the Co Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist. I'm delighted to see you all in person tonight and other attendees joining us on the live stream for the sixth and last session of our reflections. Please remember that there will be a drinks reception following um, the end of this reflection. Once again, I have updated this slide to orientate tonight's works of art within the European artistic eras. Our first work of art of this evening is the painting with the title, Peter and John Run to the Empty Tomb. Created by Eugene Bernard at, in 1898. Our second work of art is actually two almost physically connected artworks in our own co-cathedral here at St. John the Evangelist. The first of the two parts is the beautiful mandala and cross above the main altar created by John Buscemi in 2002. The second part is the superimposed bronze sculpture, Christ crucified, Christ risen, of the resurrected Christ in front of the mandala by sculptor J. Hall Carpenter, installed here in 2005. The third and final work of art of this evening is the painting, Christ appearing to St. Peter on the Appian Way, or Domini Quo Vadis, this painting was completed between 1601 and 1602 by the Italian artist Anibali Caracci, whose work we explored last week. In the first few minutes this evening, I will begin our reflection with an exploration on transcendentals particularly focusing on beauty. The word transcendental can be translated as surpassing or superior. It refers to a state of beyond the ordinary or common experience, thought, or belief. Around 400 to 300 BC, the ancient Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle recognized th three fundamental transcendental desires or properties of being. These are truth, goodness, and beauty. These transcendentals describe facets of ultimate reality about which we all 
not only have an awareness of, but have an unconscious desire for. By the fifth century AD, Christianity had expanded throughout the Western world and Christian philosophers and theologians such as Saint Augustine, Saint Thomas Aquinas and others appropriated the truths of these superior values as truths of general revelation, but grounded them in the nature of God. God doesn't have truth, goodness, and beauty. Rather, God is truth, goodness, and beauty. Throughout the centuries, the church has recognized that beauty, namely natural beauty, as well as created beauty, so any form of art, is needed. It is needed to lift up people's eyes and hearts, to restore their confidence and enthusiasm, to help them begin to dream again, and to rediscover their path towards God. The church, works of art, and their artists have been intertwined since the early days of Christianity. Painting, sculpture, architecture, music, poetry, as well as theater, dance, and other art forms were then, and of course still are, used to express faith and to present the salvation story to the world. Art can draw people towards faith in the first place, as well as deepen faith. Beauty and art offer an entry point for the appreciation of God and his creations. In 599 AD, Saint Gregory the Great, in a letter to Serenus, Bishop of Marseille, explicitly expressed the importance of paintings in representing biblical narratives, parables, and symbols. Parables and pictures were powerful tools in teaching the faith in times when few could read or write. This recognition of the value of art to the mission of the church continued and grew throughout the centuries to the present time. Over the last 60 years, reigning popes have each solemnly reaffirmed the importance of the relationship between the church and artists. At the closing of the Second Vatican Council in 1965, Pope Paul VI, now Saint Paul, addressed artists directly and renewed the alliance between the church and the artists. He concluded that, and I will quote, this world in which we live needs beauty in order not to sink into despair. It is beauty, like truth, which brings joy to the heart of man and is that precious fruit which is resistant to the wear and tear of time, which unites generations and makes them share things in admiration. And all of this is through your hands." End of quote. Thirty years later, on Easter Sunday, 1999, Pope John Paul II, now Saint John Paul, who was an artist himself, wrote a passionate letter to artists, praising the importance of their works and attested that their artistic vocation served humanity as a whole. He acclaimed that artistic inspiration resulting in art in its noblest forms 
is needed for humanity to find its way and destiny. Ten years later, Pope Benedict XVI invited 250 artists from across the world to renew the age-old friendship and encouraged new opportunities for collaboration. In the writings of these three popes, we find that, I quote, the theme of beauty is decisive for a discourse on art, end of quote. Beauty is the essential part of all created works. Beauty can save our lives. It evokes our deep feelings and allows us to contemplate the meaning of our existence. Pope John Paul II further remarked to artists that the beauty, and I quote, which you pass on to generations still to come be such that it will stir them to wonder, leading to enthusiasm of our existence. And there's one more quote I would like to mention from John Paul II. People of today and tomorrow need this enthusiasm if they are to meet and master the crucial challenges which stand before us. And then in 2006, the Papal Council of Culture discussed the way of beauty and how beauty and art could become the pathway for new evangelization and dialogue. In the concluding document, which was created by 40 cardinals, bishops, religious and lay experts in culture, they stated John Paul II's belief that artistic patrimony inspired by Christian faith is a formidable instrument of catechism, catechesis, fundamental to the relaunch, the universal message of beauty and good. And right here in our diocese of Winona, Rochester, our bishop, Robert Barron, is a strong advocate of beauty. And he emphasizes that beauty and art are important contributors to evangelization. Beauty is non-threatening. It moves us in multiple dimensions simultaneously. And it has the power to open our hearts to the message of Christ and his gospel. And we are ourselves have taken our own journey through beautiful works of art during our Lenten and Advent reflections here at St. John's. And over the last two years, we have explored, contemplated, and reflected on 75 works of art. With this brief reflection on transcendentals and the importance of beauty and art for the formation of faith, I now would like to turn over to our first work of art of this evening. Our first painting, Peter and John Run to the Empty Tomb, was created by the Swiss painter Eugene Bunand in 1898. This painting was bought by the French state for the Luxembourg Museum in Paris and now belongs to the Musée d'Orsay, also in Paris. This painting is Bernard's best known and most widely reproduced Easter painting ever made. And you can follow me along on the handout when I, while I introduce the artist. Eugene Bernard was born in 1850 in Mondon, part of French-speaking Switzerland, Initially, Bernard studied architecture. However, after receiving his diploma in 1871, he realized that his true interest and talents lay in art. He spent much of his life traveling and working in different parts of Switzerland 
and France. But he was little known outside of these countries. Bernard developed a successful career as an artist, primarily as a realist painter of nature. Most of his works were of rural scenes, often including animals. But later in his life, he painted portraits, which were felt to closely reflect the character of the sitters. In 1890s, Bernard's deep Protestant beliefs led him to create predominantly religious works of art. He became best known in Europe for his illustrations of the parables, which was published in French, German, and English versions over four decades. His final project was an incomplete series of 104 pastel portraits of allied World War I participants. This is a unique body of work that was subsequently published as a book in 1922 and republished in 2010. Bernard died in February of 1921 in Paris at the age of 71, uh, 70. As you consider our first work of art of this evening, I will quote from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, verses 3 and 4. And I quote, Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. End of quote. And now, after I have said so much, <laughs> I invite you to share with me what you see in this painting, uh, what touches you, um, which colors have been used, and for who are the figures in the painting. And Amelia will help us with the microphone tonight again. I'm just struck by the look on both of their faces. It's such a mix of apprehension and hope at the same time. Um, and, and the bright colors are, are stunning as well. But it's just, he's really captured that and the age contrast between the two, the yes. two men. Yeah, I was just thinking their eyes say everything, Actually. you know. Yes. <laughs> Along those lines, um, John uh, looks less certain and more afraid, and we know that he holds back when he gets to the tomb. Peter's the one who dashes in, right? Is that right? Yeah. So? <laughs> so, yeah. So we have John and we have Peter. Yeah. And yeah, and I just pick up on, on these comments. Exactly, so it's a, it's a rather simple painting, but it has exactly all the f our focus is on, on the face, on the facial expression, and on the hand gestures. And they say so much, isn't it? Um, there's all these mixed feelings. Um, if we start with John, um, if we start with the hands, they're clasped. So expressing hope. Um, however, if we look at his face, this is forehead, his um, eyebrows are kind of pinched together. He's not, he's also not s sure. I mean, in, there's hope. There's, l there's certainly longing in there as well, isn't it? I, I want this to be true. Because what this scene is just right after Mary Magdalene had gone to the tomb and she had found out that it was empty, that the stone had ro been rolled away and she ran back to, to St. Peter and to John to tell them that the tomb is empty. And so they're rushing out to see it for themselves. And again, using the eyes, um, the eyes are so expressive. Um, and also, um, St. Peter's hands, um, kind of this um, resting on his chest, um, but also pointing forward. And it's kind of, it's almost a question mark. It's, it's, 
It's like, yeah, I want to believe it, but is this really true? Can this be true? Um, so yeah, this wonderful mix. Yes, Amina? What, what does the sky reflect? Is it, is it glorious or so? so? Say it again, sir. Uh, you can, if you can the use the background. Oh, the the sorry, the microphone. On, no, um, oh, on your other side, sir. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> the, s the background, the sky, uh -huh. is really, or stands out too. Right. And is it a glorious or is it a somber sky? Or so I what's going on? Yeah, so, um, well, maybe put this question out. The question is, is this a, uh, a somber or a glorious sky? Yeah. Glorious. glorious, yes, I think so too. I mean, just look at the colors. It's gold all over. I mean, this is a, a 19th century painting, but and if you think of old paintings, we would have gold um, leaf. This, this is almost kind of gold leafed. Um, it's so full of this rich, warm color. It's, it's hope, right? The, the color of hope. I'm fascinated by the uh, movement of Mary Magdalene, that she would go. They were, Peter, John, the others were in fear, hiding, maybe ashamed, maybe confused hurt with all of the drama of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And then her experience moves them mm -hmm. because she goes and uh, they listen to her. You better get running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I listened to someone who had um, s reflected on the painting as well. And they said you could almost hear her voice in the painting, isn't it? Like, I was so kind of in the background, just boys, get ready, go. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it looks like the artist used the light sky because it's it, not that it's flat, but it really emphasizes the faces of John and Peter and especially Peter's eyes. Yes. That's what I see. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, and just to throw out, so it's, it's, it's hope, it's uncertainty, and I had to write down the list. Uh, confusion, I think we see fear, and the rawness of the shock of w you were referring, Father Man, to what just happened, um, bewilderment, there's grief, so they're, they're, they're working through their grief, um, and anxiety, and I, I mentioned the longing. Um, I think, so those are, so yes, it's the hand gestures, it's the faces, it's the eyes. I, I love um, the, the deep, furs in, in Peter's forehead, um, he, you can, he has a conversation within himself, he's struggling with all these emotions and what he had done and what he was supposed to be doing. And um, so I think the painting really brings this out. And the other thing, um, the artist was very successful in c creating that sense of movement. I mean, we, can almost feel the wind rippling through Peter's hair, isn't it? So while he's running so fast, you can see his hair is flying up a little bit. Uh, and and the, 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 the cloak is, is um, flaring out a little bit here as well. And I think the way he was able to do that was in, because later on we, in our last painting, we will talk about movement a little bit as well, and how that artist accomplished showing us movement. But I think in this particular work, it's the artist cropped into the scene, so we're very close to it. And then also, so this was painted in 1898, so photography had kind of been developed throughout the 19th century, but um, really kind of went mainstream probably in the, 19, uh, in the 1870s. Uh, so if we think of photography and if someone has a, a, um, attended a photography cl class, how do you show in, in, a, in a picture 
movement. And so I think the, the artist accomplished that, that he has moved the two figures far to the left. Because you could almost imagine it's, if you're not quick enough to take the picture, and if it would be in a, in a still position, John would have run out. So I think that's really a beautiful sense of this urgency, of this fast moving of the, the two figures of um, John and, and Peter moving forward, moving to the, the empty tomb, and really wanting to, to go there and see for themselves. Um, because they were the first one to experience, and they had to trust and learn the scripture and what it meant that Jesus had told them or foretold them um, while he was with them. Yes, um, I invite any, any further comments? It's really a question. Um, I wonder if you have any insight into why John is wearing a, such a white clean looking garment and then Peter with the contrast of almost a black mm -hmm. cloak that I, I don't understand. Yeah. Maybe just mm -hmm. uh, in answer to that question, I, I in one of the gospels, you know, there's a young man when Jesus is taken away by the crowd, you know, from the from Gethsemane there's a young man that just ha was wearing linen and he ran off and he ran off naked. So, and it's often surmised that that's John, actually. So, to, to think that John would wear linen, or white, might be a reasonable expectation. I was just going to um, comment, too. There's sort of biographical information about these two characters. You know, John is young. Peter is weather beaten like a like a fisherman would be, you know, out on the water every day. You can see he has a lot of hand strength. He's got those strong farmer hands, you mm -hmm. know, that you know, he's worked with his hands his whole life. He's middle-aged. You know, it's you can see who these people are. It's, these are great portraits. Mhm. Mm so just as you can hear Mary Magdalene you can also see, and you like to draw lines, but the line would go outside of the picture, and it's almost like it's pulling them there. And so you also have that forward momentum because something is clearly outside of the, the picture that they're moving toward. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm really struck by Peter, and I think it shows that it's Peter's realization that it's all true. It's all, it's all true. <laughs> yes, beautiful. I think Sebastian has it. On his shoulder, that's not a piece of cloth. Anyway, it's a piece of cloth, it's not a, 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 a garment. Th this part? Yeah, the, the blue part. So is it ready to dress up someone or? It's not a, because uh, when you see on the back, it's more a big piece, of, like a cover, versus a piece of cloth, mm -hmm. a, a, a tunic. Right. So, and I will come back. I, r I really want, would like to answer your question. Um, to start with this, I, when you see paintings and when we look at um, Christ or um, Mary depicted, you quite often have like two layers. So I think this is supposed to be kind of his tunic would be the red one, and then they wear a cloak around it. Um, I think the artist kind of chose to just kind of throw it over his shoulder. Again, you could argue they are in a rush, right? The, the message came in and they were um, leaving the house, rushing out, and he kind of just threw his cloak over his shoulder. That's kind of my interpretation on it. But just I really would like to um, answer your question. So the way I interpret it is John was the one disciple who stayed with Christ the entire time. He is 
immaculate in some sense. I don't know if I can use that word, but he's, he's kind of clean. He, he stayed with Christ. He was the only one who stayed with him on the cross. So he, I think the artist wanted to give him that more shining, clean dress. Uh, and, and Peter, he's quite often depicted in the, these particular colors, sometimes kind of an orange and blue. Um, but maybe it is the darker color. It's the, he was the one who denied Christ three times. Uh, he was the one who kind of questioned m a little bit more of what Christ was saying, and he wasn't quite falling right into um, behind Christ. And he had also, he wasn't at the cross. I mean, so maybe just to can symbolize the difference between the two in the way they had gone with Christ through the suffering. That was kind of my, yeah, wonderful. Um, this uh, is one of our, so one of my favorite paintings, but it's now time to move on. Um, and I will leave you with this question. Am I, like Peter and John, running towards the empty tomb with great anticipation? And now it is time to move on to our second work of art of this evening. And I'm sure everyone is familiar with that, but I thought it's still interesting to, to talk about this in a little bit more detail. Um, so this work consists of two parts, and it's located right here at the Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist. The first part is the beautiful mandala, or mandala-like, and the cross, above the main altar created by John Buscemi in 2002. The second part is the superimposed bronze sculpture, Christ Crucified, Christ Risen. That's the title that was given to this work of art by the artist. Of the res resurrected Christ, immediately in front of the mandala by sculptor J. Hall Carpenter, and it was created initially in 2001, and it was installed here at the Co-Cathedral in 2005 as a part of the um, enhancement change and remodeling of the, of the church. I will briefly introduce both of the artists. Uh, the information about them is directly from their personal web pages and published material, so I stick pretty close to the text that they have published, so because um, it, wasn't, it was just straightforward. Uh, and again, you can follow me on the handout. John Buscemi, Buscemi is a nationally recognized liturgical design artist and consultant from the Chicago area. For more than 25 years, John has been a consultant for building and renovation projects including work for Santa Maria de la Paz Church in Santa Fe, New Mexico, San Pius the X Church in Billing, Montana, and many more. He has shaped worship environments as small as chapels, as large as papal mass in a cornfield in Des Moines, Iowa. John was the liturgical consultant for the enhancement project of the church here in St. John's in 2001 and 2002. And he designed a mandala cross for above the main altar. John Hall Carpenter has been a professional sculptor since 1976. He studied at the Pratt Institute in New York and the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. And he was elected into the National Sculpture Society by the age of 30. He has received multiple national awards. Jay earned his reputation over 20 years as sculptor for the Washington National Cathedral, the world's sixth largest cathedral. He created the original carves, carvers models for over 500 sculptures that adorn the Gothic limestone building. These sculptures include saints, angels, grotesques, and gargoyles. 
Many American churches have commissioned his work, as have the State Department, the Smithsonian, Canterbury Cathedral, the New England Medical Center, and many other clients. And so Jay created the sculpture, Christ Crucified, Christ Risen, in 2001, which is a powerful spiritual focal point for St. John. And Jay also, I just wanted like to point this out, he also produced the enchanting angelic bronze sculpture, Ascend into Heaven, which you can find in our prayer garden just outside. And there's also the link to Jay's website on the handout. For this work of art, I would like to quote of the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 24, verses 5 to 7. And I quote, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. End of quote. And with this, um, I invite your thoughts um, about this work of art, um, how it speaks to you, what do you think about it, what kind of is, what is it that when you come into church that um, draws you to it? And I, um, Brian was kind to provide a couple of images. Um, I mean, we have all seen it. Amelia, behind you. So this has just always been just a beautiful um, uh, sculpture for my family um, when my boys were little. And um, if you take a look at the first photo again, you can see it looks like a chalice. And then the circle looks like a host. And because he's risen, uh -huh. and because of that, we're able to receive him. So that's what the boys used to think when they were receiving their first communion. Oh, beautiful. Oh, you can come up. Oh, there you go. So the actual archi ar architectural structure is the chalice that holds the the Eucharist in in it. Kind of, it kind of falls into it. <laughs> so you, as you as who studied art, how do you interpret that background, other than what Wendy said, and then uh, also. Is this an original or is it a duplicate from somewhere else? If I maybe didn't hear you say that. And when you speak of Washington, D.C., is this in the Basilica of Washington, D.C. or another church? <laughs> because in Washington, D.C., they, they show up big Jesus Christ, risen, or assume risen, with a big red, beautiful garment on. But so it's kind of three questions, but. Okay. So maybe s um, start with your second question first. So the mandala, so the stained glass, or it was made specifically for the church here. Um, that was together with, with John, the consultant. He knew of Jay's work uh, and we, they, we knew that they, we wanted to have a, a, a resurrection Christ. The, the sculpture was, in, it was created in 2001, and the sculpture has made multiple um, f uh, versions of it. So, I mean, it's the same, but you, you can choose from four different sizes, and each one comes in six editions. So throughout America, you might walk into a church and you see um, 
the resurrected Christ that we also have. So it wasn't specifically made for this space, um, but it kind of comes together just beautifully in the, the Mandela itself was specifically designed for the church. Uh, oh yeah, so, um, and so this crucifix used to be in the, in the church before the enhancement and remodeling project. And since the remodeling was finished in 2002 and the sculpture either wasn't, uh, wasn't quite decided yet, uh, so for a while actually um, the crucified Christ, the crucifixion was in front of the Mandela because the Mandela was already in, in place when the church opened. Uh, and then uh, eventually kind of was exchanged and I think this moved over and it's a, it's a beautiful place for it, um, actually also in terms of size and um, when it comes together. Um, your, your third question, um, in Washington DC, so he, w he worked in Washington DC and he worked, he worked on the cathedral and he did the outside sculptures. So J. No, I think it's the, I would, it's the, the national, the national cathedral. Yeah. Yes, and your first question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, question and a comment. So uh, um, regarding the multiple versions, do you know, is the corpus uh, separate from the crucifix in other places as well? That's one of the things that I think is so inspired mm -hmm. about it, this design is that it, Christ is um, liberated from the crucifix. Yes, so I can't speak for all of them, but I have seen three pain, uh, pictures, photographs of other versions in other places, and they all are free hanging. And I, yeah, what do you said the word? Uh, liberated. Li liberated, that's a beautiful word actually. Yes, he's liberated from the cross because it is re very much the resurrected Christ um, apart from the cross. So yeah, so the, the images I have seen, it has been uh, hung the way we also hung it, so separate from, from any background or a, a back. That's great, and one of the things I, I love so much about that image is um, sometimes when you see the resurrected Christ on the crucifix at the front of the church, uh, he'll be fully clothed, Christ resurrected, and this is not. This blends the, the crucifixion as well as the resurrection in a really unique way, I think. Yes, that's always, a, a, it takes a moment, how do you describe it? <laughs> so yeah, it's the, it's a crucifix, but with the resurrected Christ. I would like to understand what the uh, significance of the green in the mandala is. The significance of the the green uh, glass pieces. Uh huh. So, um, so it's it's a mandala, mandala like. So it's repeated patterns, first of all, and it's it's hope. The color green has been chosen to represent hope, and then these could be um, blossoms or li little flower buds. And here, it's actually, you can see that the, the stained glass that has been used for it is kind of a little bit special. It, it, it is iridescent, so it's like a, if you blow bubbles, and depending on how the light falls onto the bubble, you get a slightly different color. So these pieces were specifically chosen to place into the four corners of the flower buds uh, to enhance the visual aspect of it because depending on where you are in the church, they look a little bit pink or red or blue. Uh, during the day it changes. And then I think the artist wanted to express with that the change in, in time, the change in our lives, the change in our situation, the change in our how we feel in the in a day even. Um, so these were specifically chosen uh, for the four corners. 
um, and it just creates a beautiful full background. And, and it's, it really wants to express all the feelings of, of hope, a new life, uh, moving forward. Uh, it also, the mandala echoes that all creation was resurrected through Christ. Not, I mean, humanity, yes, but all of creation is echoed in that mandala. Uh huh. Yes, I like that. And I often think, when I look at particularly the corpus, um, it doesn't show many signs of the suffering. Uh, and it is the it's the beautiful body of Christ. It's the most beautiful man that ever was created. So I think that's um, it shows us hope and energy. And for me, it's um, he's liberated from the cross and he he moves upwards. And for me, it's many times when I when I pray, I feel he's taking my thoughts, my prayers, with him. Um, he just lifts them up, and and they go to God and to 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 heaven. And um, but he's present. I think he's, he's beautifully he's present and he's with us. Um, I think that's kind of the, um, a, a beautiful. I like uh, what everyone has said and all the different points and everything, but one of the things to me that makes this special is that it's not only the mandala and the sculpture and the way the sculpture is, but also the lighting on it from above that's kind of like he is being drawn up. Mm -hmm. Yes. The skylight right on top of Christ is so beautiful. Again, and it's kind of this, also during the day, depending on if, the, if it's a sunny day or even if it's just a cloud travels in front of the sun, it changes how it looks and how it feels, absolutely. And I, one of my particular things, in the, when we go through the church to have our drinks, um, it, the, the sun is a bit lower. I, l I still love it in, when it's dark and um, the way it looks and just with the few spotlights, and then I think it's just, it's just beautiful. I am so touched to hear how important this is to so many people. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Yes, I, I'm sorry, we do have to move on. I, I am so glad. Thank you for sharing the thoughts, and I was hoping exactly for that, because we all see it, um, but it's just nice to hear what everyone thinks about it. Um, and I will leave you with this question. Do I fully appreciate the significance of the risen Christ. And so now, actually, we just didn't need all of I would like to end our reflection series of 2024 with the painting Christ appearing to St. Peter on the Appian Way or Domini Quo Vadis by Annabali Karachi, painted between 1601 and 1602. And I just need to say something. <laughs> As I mentioned before, when I prepare for these lectures, Chris is my first editor. And by this year, I, Amelia is my second editor, or <laughs> chief editor. And they correct me, because still, I mean, I'm li I live in America for a long time now. However, there's a few words that just completely threw me off, throw me off. And so <laughs> when you see me smile or hesitate, it's, it's a word that we have practiced 10 times. <laughs> and most of the time, it still comes out wrong. Anyway. <laughs> OK. So with this painting, it was painted by um, Annabali Karachi, and we had just uh, talked about him, and we reflected on his painting, The Dead Christ Mourned, last week. And I reprinted the, in the introduction to the artist on the handout, but maybe in terms of time, um, I might not read it out because 
uh, it would be pretty much the same. But it, it suffice to say Karachi was a vital force in the, the creation of the Baroque style. As you consider our third work of art of this evening, I will quote from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 13, verses 36 to 38. I'll quote, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? End of quote. And one more time, I invite your comments uh, on this picture. Um, who are the figures? Uh, what are the elements that kind of draw us in? Um, it's kind of interesting just to kind of point this out. Um, it's actually a, a rather small painting compared to some of the works we have seen recently. Some were just huge. And so this is quite small, but it's it's at the National Gallery in London. Uh, it's, it's very imposing, even though it's, it's a, a bit smaller. Amelie? So when I look at this painting, the worst is past, and now he carries across very lightly, and he move on. <laughs> I find it interesting that Peter has on the, the same colors as the previous. Right. So is that a uh, common theme in paintings that he is included in? Yes. Very often we see Peter in the combination of the blue and kind of an orange or red, so that can shift a little bit. Sometimes it goes a little bit more into a yellow, but certainly kind of that color scheme. He looks like he's having a little trouble uh, realizing that Christ is there. The expression on his face uh -huh. and his hand kind of up to his uh, face. Yes. Right, Peter is, yeah, exactly. So I actually kind of zoomed in on that. One of the qualities that suggests the Baroque in this picture, it doesn't it look to me like uh, the, uh, you know, a painting that really points toward the Baroque. So what are, what are your uh, thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite early. So it, it was painted in 1601. So it is in the early, early, early time frame of Baroque. Uh, Karachi, lived in uh, Bologna, so he was very much um, embedded in mannerism and just kind of slowly starting to, to break away from the mannerism as well. So we don't see quite a Rubenesque Baroque style yet. Um, and I would say he probably never quite developed that anyway. I mean, he died in um, 1609. Uh, he was probably choosing some of the elements that would we consider as Baroque. So trying to implement movement into the painting, um, this coming out of the painting, kind of involving the viewer into the painting. He probably chose that, but he also, he, he liked to go back to, to the high Renaissance, kind of beautified and classic depiction of his figures. Well, what I like about it is you can see Peter recoiling from what Christ is telling him. Because <laughs> if you know the legend, you know, he's telling him, if you don't go into Rome and suffer as I did, I've got to do it again. And Peter is realizing this is real. This is my destiny to go into Rome to proclaim the word, to proclaim you as the Christ, and to suffer for it as you did. Um, yes. And 
so you see that recoiling, he's stepping back, he's got his hand up, you know, he's, this is bad news, <laughs> but, it, but it's coming from you, I've got to do it, you know, so. Yes, so exactly, so the, just to fill in, the, the background story is believed that Peter had gone to Rome, but he was threatened by the Romans that he also would be crucified, and he decided, not necessarily out of the bat, but he thought maybe I can serve Christ better if I proclaim the news a little bit away from the danger. And so <laughs> he, he decided to, to go away and leave Rome, exactly as, as Michael said. And so there is this the story that he, as he was rushing out of Rome, he met Christ on the way and he says, quo vadis, domino quo vadis, Lord, where are you going? And, and Christ says to him, well, I'm going back to Rome to be crucified again. And as you say, I mean, that kind of struck a chord to Peter, and he said, exactly, it's my destiny. I, I have to go um, and, and, and go, go back. So on the Appian Way, there is uh, a church which is called uh, Quo Vadis, which is believed to be the mark, to mark the spot where uh, St. Peter and Christ met um, and where this scene might have taken place. Um. When, or I was just gonna mention that gentleman pretty well explained it, but when you showed the close up of Peter's face, the expression on his face, yes. like, Lord, are you doubting me? <laughs> yes, so that's why, yeah, I, again, it's, it's the, the eyes, and actually I did a, another thing here. Again, we have these bulging eyes which say everything about surprise and fear and it's like, are you sure this is really what you want me to do? Again, it's this, almost a dialogue within him, and I, I loved how um, artists that have been uh, more than 200, almost 300 years apart from each other, kind of chose to use the facial expression to tell us so much um, about what is going on within the mind uh, of these people. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure he was always, he was in fast, but he also was out fast. <laughs> but, I mean, in the long run, obviously, he, he pulled his weight. Um, and, and just kind of, in, in general, so this is a rather unusual depiction. Oh, sorry, Amelia, yes, please. Also, when you showed the two paintings at the same time, they both have really big noses. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that was a characteristic of St. Peter. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a rather a, an unusual um, moment to pick in Peter's life, but again, I think to, to end our ref reflection for this year, I think it is, it's a really telling painting uh, for us to, again, we have to make the decisions, which way, which way am I going? Um, am, I, am I going out or am I sticking around? Um, and yeah, um, and it's not a mistake, uh, but I thought I will repeat the question from tonight's, from the previous work of art, because I think it's such a pivotal importance for our faith, and it's a good way to enter the series. Do I fully appreciate the significance of the risen Christ? Thank you very much. <laughs>